talks is available now. It obviously makes it difficult for people to hear and to understand. And the way we prevent it, maybe it'll work with these jokers now, is you put food out in the hall. So when you put food out in the hall, then, then people out in the hall are, are eating and talking and are doing precisely what these people are doing, which is disrupting what's in the discussion. Um, so, as far as I'm concerned, it makes it a little easier to hear if other people are talking at the same time. That's all. You want to comment on that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, anything to make it tough. Yeah, anything to make it tough. That's the part. That's the other part. The other part of it is, uh, you know, experience is always complex and multi level. And we tune our attention to different levels of awareness. And I think that that's uh, you know, a major part of the environment. But that's why Alexander Cut the Nod actually experience isn't always like that. Well, and and it, it, in fact, it, the alternative is also plausible. And the way you understand what's complicated to some extent is to understand its opposite. So the question is, I guess the question that follows from that is, is this the exception that has become a rule? Because nobody in the room is cutting the knot. Everybody is trying to be complicated. Well, I don't think everyone's trying to be complicated. I think I hear a lot of people here just paying attention and you know, just absorbing Talk about the content of the exhibit, <laughs> not the listening audience. I, 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 I don't think it's about being with a very particular set of intentions, and those intentions have to do with doing work which basically has a uh, capacity for open interpretation and arousing a, a certain state of desire to want to sort of know and understand, but it's the, the content isn't laid out in a kind of didactic way. It's meant to be something which provokes curiosity and allows for the imagination to operate. But if it operates in a consistent way, I think it's precisely the opposite. It's extremely didactic. It's a, it's, a, it's a point of view, and it's a clear point of view. Whether to call it an allegiance, I'm not sure. But it doesn't really, if experience is complicated, it's complicated because there are different ways to experience. So you can cut the knot, and you can take it apart. Sure. But if all you do is imagine that the knot is only amenable to being unraveled, then you're missing an opportunity. I don't imagine I one of those things is the only option. I think there are many options. But, but I don't, I, myself, I don't basically... With the knot. I don't basically try to, try to predetermine how anybody wants to deal with it. And I think the word, the word basically speaks to that issue. That different people come to it at different levels because experience deals not only with you know, sort of sensory input, but also deals with sort of, you know, value systems, and the value systems are what you're referring to, in regard to the diversity of approaches, and also deals with the ability of people to cognitively to deal with multiple associations. But in a teaching, in a teaching sense, if you want people to understand that, that this is not something to believe in, it's not like this, it's one way to see. And the question is, what? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. What? She wanted me to speak louder. Oh, okay. I thought she was part of the act. So <laughs> you want to do it again? Anyway, I, I think what what interests me. It's funny. I was talking about this last night. We've always felt in the work that we do. And if you can show a project or a space with a single photograph, with one photograph, that it failed. And it failed because the process of understanding either a building or a venue or a space does require a number of vantage points, not a single vantage point. I guess what I'm saying is, you say experience is complicated. I think what I'm saying is that this is a single vantage point. And it actually doesn't illustrate the fact that experience is complicated. 
I think it's more singular. <coughs> I, I, think, I think that maybe you're just experiencing it with a very brief exposure here because certainly the content, brief, so certainly the content of the, the graphics and the photography and the writing are very multidimensional. The, the smell in the room is another thing which carries a whole set of associations for, for different people in different ways. The color, the texture, the walk you on, you walk on it very differently than you do in other, other spaces. I think there's a lot of sort of sensory input here that allows for you know processing in lots of different ways. And I think it's very open. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't, there's not a single channel of communication here. There's multiple channels of communication that are operating. Well, I think what I, I mean, in order to But yes, it's a singular point of view, it's my point of view. Right. Basically, I believe in mystery as a ground of experience. I don't believe in knowability as a ground of experience. I believe that basically manifoldness is richer than singularity and exclusiveness. Those are the things I believe in. The opportunity to do a show is basically an opportunity to put forth my point of view. Right. Right. So I did. So that's what we're talking about. In, in terms of, I did, but I did another show. Right. The other show was basically what you said. You can't show, or a building is a failure if you only have one photograph that can represent No, we're not talking about that show. Know, but no, what I'm saying, but in terms of this experience, that why would I want to do the same thing again? I had that show. I did that in terms of that. There were 50 images of projects, which were very, very diverse, very you know, uh, involved in multiple ways of view. Okay. This, this, this is something very different. Well, let's try to talk about what's in the room. Sure. As opposed to yeah, what, whatever you what, want. what preceded it. So the, you know the argument for deconstruction? No, probably not. I'm sure you do. Well, if, if Herman Melville writes a book, and it's called Moby Dick, right. and he has a point of view, right. and he has an idea, right. and he tells a story, a half issue, and so on and so on. And Paul DeMond comes along and he says, there is no Moby Dick. Yeah. There are only Moby's Dick, or Moby Dicks, right. whatever it is. Sure. And, the, and why is that so? Because everyone who picks the book up, comes from a different vantage point. Ergo, there are multiple Moby Dicks. There is no single Moby Dick. Of course. You agree with that? Of course. Yeah. So there is no single Moby Dick. Right. So the role of, I think Herman Melville probably wouldn't agree with that. Uh, but, and nor should he. So the role of the author, in your view, is to make something available which offers a number of vantage points as opposed to insisting on one or the other. No, the role, the role of my authorship is to basically arouse a sense of curiosity and mystery, and therefore encourage people to engage in the work in a way through their imagination. That's, that's my... In, in what sense, would you, would you categorize the exhibit as an architecture exhibit? Um, you know, that's an interesting question because I don't, I don't make distinctions between architecture, art, and design. I don't make those well, distinctions. Well, try to make one. No, I don't make those distinctions. I, I have the distinctions that I make. Well, I don't distinctions. make the distinctions. No, you ask me the question. Well, when you say, you know what I'm going to answer anyway, but in a different way than you want me to answer. This is me to press. Yeah, yeah. You're coming with a no, 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 this is me and you fight it. Okay, so this, 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 this is what we need to do now. Uh, so, I think that for me, and I'm talking personally for me, that the, the, the quality of those endeavors, architecture, graphics, design, furniture, whatever, and all those things I try to do the best I can, the basic purpose of those things is to create an aesthetic experience. And, uh, She's deaf, she may be able to just a long time. write your name. What's your name? What's her name? I don't know. She just came off the street. You don't know or you won't say? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very good. That's your, that's your grade? <laughs> <laughs> she put an A in the desk. Very esoteric. For Alexander the Great. Okay, so I, I'm trying to... Uh, in a line of uh, discussion. The question was, this is School of Architecture, actually. School of Architecture.
School of Architecture, which doesn't say architecture, might be graphics, might be art, might be poetry, might be building, pick a card. It actually doesn't say that, nor is it inclined to do it, although it's certainly willing to let any number of people take a crack at the definition. The question is, is this architecture? If somebody came along and said to you, what? Make me a jail. Yeah, but I think, 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 I got to get the question out before the uh, janitor comes back. <laughs> so, if, if somebody comes along and says to you, we need a jail, or we need a school, and the context of that discussion is a social context, it's a political context, it's the world we're operating in. I mean, after all, in China, they're moving the Yellow River, and they just built a train from Shenzhen to Guangzhou to Shanghai to Beijing. Those are all big pieces of construction. They have content. I think they deal with architecture. So this is, so this is really the subject. If somebody says to you, make a jail, and you say to me, it's about the individual experience of the prisoners, let's accommodate the interpretive capacity of the prisoners in the jail. And the sheriff comes along and he said, wait a minute, I got to lock up Charles Manson and whoever the hell is, needs to work, needs to close, needs to be operationally intelligible in a utilitarian way. Okay. Is that ruled out of this discussion? No. Where is it in the, where would you find that in the room? I don't think it's in the room necessarily. But I think, I think you're, you're trying to cast the context of this discussion in ways which basically, it's not about this work. This work is about something else. This work is about a, about a way in terms of the process in which I work, personally in terms of the way I work, the way I discover things that interest me. And those things that interest me then can manifest themselves in the architectural work that I do and the architecture that I teach. It's a different thing. If, if, wait, just a minute. If in fact the gallery is about allowing those tentative ideas which you wrote recently in the car, but allowing those things to manifest themselves, and the sort of delicacy of those things, this is about this is about kind of delicate set of issues. Are you mixing up two different things? No, it's not mixing up. Two the what the gallery allows in terms of content is not what the gallery allows in terms of discourse. And the purpose of the discourse is not simply to genuflect for whoever did the ex exhibit. I didn't ask because, you because well, because the exhibit belongs to the content that the exhibitor decided. In which case, it really doesn't matter what anybody says except you. No, everybody. Which is what I'm trying to this in any way they want to Well, okay, so that's what I'm doing. I'm raising the interpretation, and it's important, I think, in, in the context of the discussion, to put this in a perspective which you may not be comfortable with. Nevertheless, in the context, I'm, not, I'm not uncomfortable with the issues you're raising. I'm just saying that I have other ways in which I thought that's about it. That's fine. But I'm not uncomfortable with it. That's fine. But then you want to do a monologue, which is not what we're doing. I'm doing a monologue. Eric, I think you're talking about three quarters more than I am. Well, it's still three <laughs> more. So it's not a monologue. It's a monologue. Yeah, we've got 47 people over here. No, there were 17. In janitorial service. <laughs> You're in open janitorial. I, I got, I got my, anything, anything to abrogate the content of the discussion. I think, I think the point is not, is not so much to say, you're right, I'm right, you can do what you want to do because this gallery facilitates that. I think the objective of the discussion is to allow us to understand from the point of view of people in the School of Architecture, many of whom are not in your class, many of whom will never take your class, and, and in what ways are these, is this exhibit useful, productive, insightful, in what ways is it either, I don't know, they call it defensive, dogmatic, representing itself as open, but in fact won't admit a kind
kind of a kind of adversary interpretation which doesn't fit the context of your requirements. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to any interpretation you want to bring to it, but let's just, let's just jump back to the issue of, of you know, what value this one might have to the students, for example. Okay, so the, the, the objects that I make basically have a number of issues which I think are actually quite relevant if you want to pay attention to them. Number one is that there's a, there's a concern right now in architecture towards single surface architecture. And basically that's an issue, which I think in many cases, in terms of the quality of experience, edits out the range of diversity. And so these objects, while they, while they have strong I, mean, I don't know that that's true. I don't I'm know whose concern that is. It's my concern. It's certainly not. It's my concern. Concern. It's our concern. It's my concern. No, you're saying there's an issue in our I think there is. I think there is an issue in our Give me an example. You know, there's a lot of work in this school that has to do with single service art. The basic is kind of what do you mean by single service? I mean planar architecture? Yeah, it, can, it, can be, it can be planar, it can deal with certain senses of mass and form making, but it basically has to do with the dominance of a single surface in terms of expression. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it, but in terms of my own, in terms of my own, the context of the discussion is what does it mean? Yeah, in terms of my own interest, these objects have, have a sense of that in terms of the shroud and the place over them. But at the same time, they have multiple expressions with regards to their different aspects of sort of interest and detail. That's one aspect of it. The other, they're, they're multi-sided. Most, most forms in sports. So, so the exhibit, I was going through so many things. So this exhibit has an adversary. Yeah, it's, it's not an adversary. It's, 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 it's personal exploration of mine. It's not an adversary right, at all. Right, right. You're saying it's pointed at a tendency for no. single service I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm aware of that in the of this is, this is a rebuttal. No, it's not a rebuttal. It's just another alternative. Okay, it's an alternative to right. single surface architecture. Yes, correct. So it has an enemy. Well, you know, those are your words. I don't think it's an enemy at all. It's an opposition. I think that's, that's, another, that's, another, that's another, a compliment. That's another thrust in the world. I've heard that. I think it's a compliment. <laughs> Uh, not that much of it. Uh, so, those are, those are some aspects to it. If you want to pay attention to it, you want to look at the work with that kind of possibility. There's, there's lots of things here to be discussed in terms of this school. Well, I think, I think the point is that it doesn't exist, and I think, I think you presented it as content unto itself. And the relativism of the experience belongs to the person looks at it. And I'm saying it's about, is it architecture? And it turns out that at least one interpretation is that it, it, it's an effort to engage or to communicate or to, an ex, to exchange a perspective which is different than a perspective that you don't approve of. I'm not approving of it, Eric. It's a matter of this. It's a matter of I just have a different reaction to it. I approve of lots of things that I myself wouldn't do because they just don't interest me personally in terms of the value. It's, a, it's okay to say there's something you don't like. Well, I understand that. And I, I don't have any problem with that. But I don't have problems with that work I'm talking about. There's another issue here, too. You know, what, in what way do these things exist? Do they exist architecture? Are they models? Are they furniture? What, yeah. So what's the, in the room? No. So the, the question for me, this space to me is a very, very difficult space, number one. Number two, because because it's a really awkward gallery space in terms, in terms of the quality of the experience, in terms of how you enter the space, how you circulate through it. That ceiling is way too busy. Isn't that, isn't that a function of who's putting on the exhibit? It, it, by your I, I, I said me. I said for me, so it's, it's difficult not for me. empirically awkward. I said it's difficult awkward for me. <laughs> difficult for me. I said difficult for me. Okay, so. And the other thing that's difficult for me is when I began to think about the scale of this room relative to what I might do, that was a difficult thing for me. I basically am really comfortable doing buildings, I'm really comfortable doing furniture, I'm really comfortable doing things smaller than furniture. Things that sort of have an environmental quality in the district, that's an uncomfortable scale for me. I struggled with it for a long time. So then the issue for me became in terms of the exploration of this opportunity was what can I begin to do to deal with that issue of scale in terms of the work? So there's a lot of different ways in which you can think about these things. 
Are they architectural models? Are they furniture? Are they, are they, are they large scale models of buildings? Or are they in fact a fragment of a building in some cases? But for me, it became how do I begin to deal with those scalar issues in terms of the world? For me. Okay. And, and the answer to that in a pedagogical way or a didactic way is what? What do you mean the answer? The answer has to work. No, 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 but you're saying you, this is a difficult room for you. Yes. It's a difficult room relative to scale. No, it's, a, it's, difficult, it's difficult, yeah, for scale. You didn't, for you me, didn't, for you me didn't hang anything no, from the top. I didn't. You didn't push anything through the wall. No, I didn't. Nothing's flying out the side. No. So the, the objects are, relatively speaking, similar in size, and they all sit on the floor. Yes. Right? Yes. So you came with a conclusion that you're now comfortable with. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the work. If I move that over six so inches, like, make any difference? Yeah, think about that. It would. It would. So what, it, it conceptually, what anchors the pieces in the room? My perception. So it's your sense of? Yeah, my sense of, my sense of what animates the room and how people move through the room. Less, you know, kind of crowded situation. How, how that would work relative to the graphics and how we would be the information that's contained in the order. But I, I think in the end, maybe this is a little bit unfair, but in the end, what you're saying is you make a judgment. And I could see any number of arguments for moving pieces, flipping yes. and, and conceptually, which might suggest very different sensibilities. Sure. If you took this thing and flipped it upside down, for instance, sure. the top was the bottom and the bottom sure. was the top, as opposed to the bottom is always the bottom and the top is always the top, and the mechanism for making things, whether it's different than single surface, is consistent in and of itself. So for sure there's, what I was arguing about with the knife and the row was inconsistency, which it seemed to me at least theoretically would make the point in a more in, in a more ecumenical way than coming to a conclusion sure. that seems to be very consistent and in the end sort of predictable. In other words, I mean, if I walked into the room, got a sense of it, turned around and walked out, would I have sure changed myself in terms of what I have to learn here? Yeah. In other words, do I know it immediately when I come to it? Whereas if one no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't typically do work that has that kind of immediacy. I do work that. But I mean, I'm not talking about in what work. But you did not answer. No, I mean in this room. I don't think in this room. I think the work requires a considerable amount of time to stay with the work and a considerable amount of time to get graphics because there's a lot of content in the images on the wall, both in terms of the images and in terms of the text that basically add a kind of broad range of. Broad range of emotional content to this work, which basically you can't get by walking into the room. But then you have to read it. You have to read it. You have to look at each. Yeah. So as a as a spatial experience, <coughs> as a spatial experience, does what's on the wall, which seems to be plainer to me, but we could debate that. In other words, it doesn't move into the room, or if it does, it does so pretty subtly. And, and you did the same thing with the curtain right. the last night, which actually made it was a pain in the neck to actually see the paintings. Yeah. So you had to futz around with the curtain. Yeah. With the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody that you love is there. Wow. Well, this is America. I know your voice still counts. Uh, Mr. Hoosier and Cow. Um, but the question is if, as a space, you have to read what's on the images. So the, the, the images on the wall contribute to the conception of the space, or they mean something different. In other words, there's a reading and there's an experience. Yes, the readings are an amplification. Huh? The readings are an amplification. So if you come into the room and you, you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't read them. You don't have to. I know, but you've lost something. I think I think that you gain something if you read them. But it's not it's spatial. It's poetry. Yeah, well, thank you. But it's poetry. Well, you read it, you tell it. I wouldn't say Well, that. maybe it's poetry. Maybe. What would you say? That's my writing. Yeah. Right. But in, in the context of architecture, is, does writing count? Poetry, 
narrative writing count as an aspect of making a volume or a space? Well, I mean, you're talking about writing in this room, counting. Yeah. You know, I think it, I think it does in the sense that there's a, a sense of sort of expanded mind space when you read it in terms of my own experience with the writing. The writing is incredibly important to me in terms of the work I do because it allows me to flesh out in more nuanced ways, in more pointed ways, the kind of emotional content I try to bring to the work. So it's very important to me. And I think that it adds something. If, if you read what's on the wall, and then you walk around the room, okay. or if you see what's on the wall and don't read it, right. and walk around the room, yeah. do you understand the room differently, differently by reading what's on the wall? Or could you take what's on the wall, put it in a pile, no, put a cover on it, and read it as a book? If you walk into the room, you know, one, two, five, ten people like the Jarvis Wilson experience, and you read I think your experience of what's in the room is radically different spatially, yes. Well, could you give us an example of that? I mean, take a yeah, piece of something. Probably not. Like, I don't really know that. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I mean, in other words, if somebody walked up to item number three, yeah. can you read it or do you have to, you can't see it? No, you can read it. Can you see it? All of it? Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. All of it. right. Because one of the odd things about this is the glass isn't polarized. And so when you walk up to the glass, what you see is your own face. Yeah, I like that too. Right, but that makes it a little tough to read your yeah. face. No, yeah, I understand that. Right. Yeah. So that's intentional. It's intentional. Because you, so that makes it tough to read. Yeah, it's intentional. So if it's important to read what you have to read and you can't read it. No, you have to make a choice. Do you want to spend the effort to do it? And that's an important part of it. <laughs> because making that choice enriches, enriches one's experience. One owns the experience when one makes that choice. Otherwise, you walk into a the painting issue, and you know, there's a less of a bar in the image. When you have to make a choice, it's that, it's that moment of decision, which is the moment which makes this most human, and it actually magnifies the quality of our experience. Makes this most human. Uh, some of you know, and I, this is, this is uh, I think, a standard question that has to do with galleries and art in galleries. If you walk into a, if you walk into the Louvre and you saw the Mona Lisa and two feet away you saw, I don't know, like Caravaggio and so on and so on and so on. And when you see, and there's an argument which is sometimes made, that you take the Mona Lisa and you stick it in one room and that's all you get in the room. You don't get anything else. And the question is when you put many images on a wall, so is that suggesting that the context of the image in the end is multiple images? I mean, again, I know what you're going to say to this, but if I took the fifth one from the end and pulled it out, would that make a difference in terms, or pulled it out and put it in the front of the line? How do those things affect the context of the discussion? Uh, I, I think that you could probably very easily do what you just suggested. You could move those images, you could move those images around. So they're not chronological? They're not chronological. I, I actually I did, but uh, one of the students who helped me did. He I asked him to select the images and put them in the order that he felt they were, and he did that. So the next time you hang it, it could be a different yeah, absolutely, order. Absolutely. Would it have to be in a line? No. It could be up and down. It could be in the room. Yeah. But that affects the space. It affects the space, and basically I, I, I put them in the room like this so that you would have a linear quality to the space, which countered quality of the spaces of these objects which are covered in vertical and dealt with some of the other linear elements that are in the room. So it basically speaks to the space. There are all sorts of subtle things. You know, that painting back there is next to that bar. Those, there's a gap in those paintings down there. What's below that gap? Well, you said that. An electric, electrical socket. But there's a lot of real subtle things. Why are these in this light? Because of the actual light switches on the floor. So they're all, it's, it's very subtle sort of spatial qualities. It's a very delicate kind of thing. It's not a big thing hanging in the space. It's perfectly fine, so we want to do that. My aesthetic, my interest is basically dealing with things which are a little more fragile than that. But, I mean, in some of it's, some of it's nomenclature. I mean, essentially what you're saying is that with the alignment of the images on the wall, which coincides with, usually when you put a plug on the wall, put a firebox on the wall, yeah. and 
and those are our five pillars. When you line everything up, you get kind of the Barcelona pavilion. I mean, in other words, idiomatically or ideologically, I mean, that's a language we know. So whether that counts for subtle or not, I don't know. I mean, I'm not too sure it does. Or the fact that, that one piece aligns with something else isn't automatically a subtlety. It could also be a banality. Because as soon as it gets to be a rule system, it gets to be pretty easy. Yeah, but there's a, but there's a, there's a lot of things in terms of banal things that basically, basically that's, that's the issue in which we, we as designers, we try to take, take the banal structure of the world in many cases and raise that to a level of awareness and appreciation. That's why I mentioned the jail. Because the door closed in a prisoner state. That's a banality. Yeah. Yeah. But if the door doesn't close and a prisoner doesn't stay in, then you have other problems. So that is a subject for architecture, notwithstanding, albeit it's a banality, but it's a subject. That's why I asked you if the subject was in here, and I think what you're saying it is, because it has to do with an alignment of pieces. I think, I think that the, the answer to all of your questions is that there's, there's a lot of subtle relational structure here. You know, and you spend a little time, it basically seeps. You see it. If you, if you come in and you're rushed and you want to look at it, you don't like what's here, you don't like the objects, you don't like the solids on the floor, you don't like the smell, you know, you have to sort of spend some time here to sort of let it soak in. But you understand, uh, I don't think anybody is saying. opposed to time. I know what you're saying. And nobody is opposed to patience. Right? And nobody is opposed to putting in sufficient time to understand in a way that's useful to that person. But that doesn't mean that the issue of time related to content or big decisions and small decisions are not discussable. Because it's conceivable you could put a lot of time into something and come back with very little. Or a little time and come back with a lot. So the fact that you advocate patience doesn't mean it's a virtue. It has to be a virtue for me, it's a virtue for me, Eric. Not always. <laughs> It's not always a virtue. No, because it's not always a virtue, is it? I said, for me, patience, <laughs> even for you, patience in terms of the things I make is a virtue. Did you appreciate what Alexander the Great did with the not? Yeah, of course. Well, that's not patience, that's impatience. Yeah. Well, that might just be smarts. Right? It might just be smarts. It might not have anything to do with patience or anything. <laughs> You reckon that there's not, you think that it's going to be a hell of a long and, time. And you got a big sword. You know, what, so it's just like, what do I do with this and what do I do with that not? Okay, let me ask you a couple of other things. Yeah. Get the hell out of here. Um, the, uh, I, I suggest to all of you that you read the text uh, that Koi supplied, because I think the language is particularly useful, and it's not the language you normally find in a discussion of architecture um, and there was there was one I think it was Braille visual Braille but in a visual Braille um, shadows stains visual visual Braille shadows stains murmurs inklings of things, which is more covert than overt. And that seems to be the context in which you're that is. working. Right. That's what you're advocating. Right. So uh, I wonder if right. visual braille, so if this has something to do with visual braille, if you can't see you're actually blind, and you come to know something that presumably somebody who can see can't know. Huh? So if you're blind and you operate according to Braille, so in terms of a sensibility, you come to know something that is probably intrinsically impossible for someone who can see. Is that a fair, fair statement? Sure that that all yeah. Yeah. Well, Okay, so if this is visual braille, that's so, huh? it's your turn. Yeah, no, I'm not saying this exhibit is visual braille, I'm saying that's an interest. You know, 
point of the point of that basic visual program is that it really has to do with sense training programs. So that when one looks at something and reacts to it primarily visually, to what extent does that activate appreciation of other sense modality? So, so the, right. the braille meaning the tactile sense, right? So the visual braille refers to that collapsing of sense modalities into an experience. What I'm what I'm trying to do is I, I think it's I think it's suggestive because it suggests that one incapacity leads to a different capacity. Incapacity provokes a capacity. You can't see, and so you learn to see by feel. Understand. Okay. Well, uh, that's again. I mean, I'm saying, I'm in the so in, in the context of this discussion, the question is, what do we come to understand? Either because we have a problem, because we can all see, or what are we being taught in terms of a kind of visual braille conception to feel or to understand, which ordinarily we wouldn't. I couldn't answer that question. That, that was something that an individual would have to answer. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you. Let me tell you what happened last night. It's, a, it's, a, it's an oblique answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that will be dirty. <laughs> so, so you talk about running from here. <laughs> no, I was going to talk about your campaign manager. Uh, so last night, put all this in, put, put the sawdust down, and there was a lot of students. They would be happy to hear it late at night. And they all come to the balcony. And I look up there, and every one of them has this huge smile on their face. Huge smile on their face. Why? Yeah. Smell and color. They're all like, God, it smells great and color is fantastic. That's your answer to their answer. That's what they told me. That's what they told me. So it's like, so everybody had the same reaction? No, yeah. Everybody didn't say that. Quite a few people said that, but they all had a smile on their face. Yeah. So, so they, what they come away with is that there's a, there's a kind of deprivation, you know, it's been revealed that in some way. Okay, okay. so this is really actually you almost answered the question. Well, I tried, you know, but I was trying to do this. That's right, that's <laughs> That's why they call it dancing. But no, I, 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 think, I think the uh, the point would be, and I think Coy certainly does this here from time to time, that the work suggests qualities in architecture that might not in the end operate in a self-sufficient way, although I think he thinks they do, but are a sensibility that, that might be missing in action more times than not. So if the place stinks or if it's red, all of that, so this may suggest something that, 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 in your view, is missing from the general discourse in architecture. I think in some cases that's true. Yeah. Here. Here. Right. So you're filling that void. Well, you know, I'm not sure I'm filling it, but you know, I stick my foot out there and try to trip it. <laughs> <laughs> uh,
So if they're, li if they're looking to learn from it, they're trying to understand what it is in order to say not only what it is in a positive sense, but what it includes and what it omits. And if it omits... I, 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 think, I think actually that's, that's your mindset. I think most people think they're in a really positive, affirmative way. I think that they're very rarely concerned with what's being omitted. They're really concerned with the positive nature of what they're Well, saying. an architecture would never move. <laughs> no. I, no. I mean, and it always no, moves. No, no. Somebody else reacts to the work. That's what I'm talking about. I thought you said the person who made the work. No, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. I'm talking about correct. students who correct. look at the sure. work, sure. learn from the work, right. but not right. just the work. And that doesn't seem to be part of the discussion or plausible in this discussion. No. I, I think that there can be any number of reactions to the work. What would you do to the room to make it less awkward? Number one, I'd bring the tracks in about four feet so you could get adequate lighting on the wall. <laughs> because the, the, the gallery basically is not set up for work on the wall at all. So that, that would be number one. It's very, very difficult for them to do. That helps you because then when you look at the work on the wall, the lights reflect and you can't see what's uh, in it. Yeah, so no, you made it work. No, because you, you, you get the hot spots on the wall, which are basically more dramatic than the, 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 the images. So you have to you have to, you have to work on the images. <laughs> okay. Uh, any corrections? Comments? Other contributions?
like it, don't like it, open to right issues or the wrong issues from the gallery. The nature of this work is essentially trying to introduce, to do for myself, and then introduce to the student body that basically it's, it's an open-ended process and you have to you have to open yourself up to try to express you know, what it is, how delicate it is for yourself in terms of what you think is important in the world and try to bring it forward. That's, that's all I'm trying to do. I guess I was hoping to understand if there is anything that is procedural between the image and the last design that then can be reapplied. No, it's a, it's a, no, it's a sense of real, it's a sense of a, so the answer to your question is when I first started when I was when I didn't have gray hair. Basically, I designed, designed a building that was really terrible. Really terrible building. And then I tried to do a drawing of it. I'd never done drawings before. And I tried to do a drawing of it. I worked very, very hard over a long period of time to try to do a drawing that basically had the qualities that the building should have had. And all of a sudden I found that I could, I could actually do a drawing that gave something to me that was closer to what I wanted the building to express. Once I did that, once I understood that, then I could go back and start working on the building, another building in a different way. So I was able to, through an through a architectural representational process, understand something about a more full, fully embodied experience. And then I was able to develop techniques for embodying that more. So this work is essentially about that same sort of exploration for me, in terms of how I might begin to do that. I think it's, it's very familiar. Really important up and, and very useful. And you guys have <laughs> all the time. Um, it, there's a discussion between you and yourself. And, all the time. Right. Um, but I think what Orlando was asking about, if, if you say you made a building that wasn't very yeah, good. Terrible. And uh, so nobody quite knows what that means. Or why it was terrible, nor, not only nobody knows, but people don't know your work, but in a conceptual way, as a kind of axiom for working back and forth between a drawn object and something built, or right. something that might be built, and how that reciprocity actually works, because I think what Elena is asking you about, and I think this is, this is of some interest, is, what comes next, or what does this tell you about what's lacking in this that will change this, which will change this? And, and although you answer it in a very open way, you answer it in a very non-specific way. Yeah. And you talk about subtleties, but you, one has to understand that, otherwise this is a, a virtuous word which has no backup. It has backup in your experience, but somebody's trying to understand. I mean, if you align a picture frame with a plug on the wall, and this, so this is a discussable point, it's not, it's not axiomatic. And then you said, I think, something really interesting, but it's not new either that you wanted to do something that, that, that had very little to do what was, with what was recognizable as a building. No, I just said as no, architect. Recognizable as architect. As architect. You want to do something which is not recognizable. Yeah, but that produces the architectural okay. experience but it doesn't look like it. Okay, so, so this sounds very intriguing and interests everybody. But you have to say a little bit more precisely what exactly that means. I don't know what it means. No. All, all I know is all I know. No, I mean, these things are these things are really you know, they're really delicate things. That are basically the, the mood, the emotions. I mean, I basically don't work like you work or like Ming works or like anybody else. I work differently. The way I work, especially, I work from a feeling tone. There's a there's a kind of uncomfortableness that I get with things. For me personally. And out of that uncomfortable is I have to sort of struggle to figure out what can I put into the world that will resolve that for myself and give myself a sense of wholeness with regard to mind and okay. okay. let's, let's, well, let's not do this as a kind of comparative <laughs> historiography. I don't know how you work. You probably don't know how Ming works. I don't think that's, I'm just that's really the issue. But I think what would be interesting to people who are listening is in a somewhat more 
incremental way to understand what it would mean to create an experience which is architectural, but which is not architecture in a recognizable way. I mean, I think if you ask Patrick Schumacher, he would say, yeah, I agree with that. I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. so, so when you hear it, and you could imagine any number of people stipulating to that and saying, yeah, I do that. Mm -hmm. And yet, what you're doing is a little bit different. Presumably what they're doing is a little bit different as well. So the question is, how do you do that? This is not a parametric argument. It's a different argument. So this is in a way why we I can't tell you how to do it. I can't tell you. Basically, I, I muck around. You know, and I guess you try this, I try that, and all of a sudden something begins to speak to me that basically begins to have a quality that I'm looking for. But basically there's no, it's not a, it's not a, but okay, it's not a system, it's not a system, it's not a method, it's not a rule, it's not an allegiance. Although, I mean, you start to look either for what's available. So where are you talking? I don't know what I'm talking about. You're trying to make, make, make I mean, you know, well, I'm trying to help the people in the room understand a little no, something I, I, that might be extremely valuable. If you what I, what I figured out, I'll be happy because there's people that actually make it expensive. Or you, should, you should do that. But it's not a matter of exactly of figuring it all out, is it? Because you never do that. I think it's no, more it's, a matter it's, it's of... A, it's a matter of me being comfortable and knowing well enough that I can explain it in a way which I think has some meaning from Right now I can't do that. But you said something a little bit different. You said being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Of course, I don't like to for myself. I am. But if you're... Right. And so discomfort isn't discomforting. It's actually not you're looking for it. Of course. In which case... It shouldn't be a problem to explain something which either doesn't add up no, or is awkward. You can't explain the resolution of that discomfort. You can't do that because I haven't resolved it. No, this is not somebody writing the last chapter. I'm just talking about a way of thinking or feeling or working, which is, I think, sounds intriguing, sounds intelligent but is translatable into seven different languages. And in, in which case, the people who are listening don't know how to make the translation. Uh, I'm not so sure that they know how to do that. I mean, I think that you're probably comfortable letting me figure that out. I'm sure they are. Yeah. It's a miracle. Yeah. You can figure out whatever you want. I'm just talking about another responsibility, which I think is slightly different which is to see how we can pass that along. And I'd be happy to pass it along as soon as I figure it out. Thank you for listening.